Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everyone. Uh, I, I don't think I'm going to bring the energy that I had last week, Bill. Uh, I was on a, a high from the, uh, the Paul Ryan Marco Rubio rise, but I'm in a little low energy this week. So, uh, you're, not on a, you're not on a post-election Matt Bevin rise? Uh, I do not have Bevin mania, um, <laughs> but I guess it's, it, it's good that he won. I guess uh, that Jack Conway, is that the guy who ran against him, needs to... Jack- uh, He's, needs to, he's now a two, two-time loser. He, uh, you know, he got people thought he could have beaten Rand Paul for Senate in uh, 2010, and fell short there with the Aqua Buddha mess. And Rand was seemingly a more competent campaign this time around, uh, but uh, the polls were showing him at around 45 percent, and Bevin around 40. And there was a third-party guy, the the, the founder of Fark dot com, uh, had was getting a few percentage points. And so Bevin winning by, I think, I think by uh, about nine uh, people saying, well, the, the polls were wrong again, yeah. although it sort, of, but sort of not quite because Conway actually matched what the polls were saying. It's just that all the undecideds or there seemed to be a, a, an undecided sleeper vote that, that went to Bevin in the last days. So we, we don't quite know if the polling was off or just there was a, that shift at the end that the, yeah. the polls. Just, but would, it does could, make could you wonder. Catch. It does make you wonder, Bill, because we have, I mean, I can't, you know, I, I, I've been going on TV a lot lately, and, and I, I can't, I mean, half the time I go on, it's about a new poll. And uh, the, the whole premise of our entire conversation is about uh, who's up, who's down uh, in, in, uh, in a given poll. And it does make you wonder how much of what uh, the chattering classes are chattering about is, is based on flawed uh, or questionable polling. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, every so often I put up a poll about the Republican presidential race and a commenter on Twitter, you know, tweets back, this sample size is only 350 people or 400 people. What, this is ridiculous. And I remind them, you know, every primary poll that you have seen this entire year, <laughs> um, you know, almost to a fault it is around – is between 300 and 400 people. I've, I've, I've seen some with less than 300. I mean, I think typical, you know, 300, 400 is what I'm seeing because you tend to do a national poll of around 1,000 well, or shouldn't so. It be, I mean, shouldn't it be 500 people to be, uh, um, you know, accurate, statistically accurate? I mean, isn't that well, these, sort of well, the these polls have, accepted? They all have wide margins of error because the sample sizes are smaller. So you tend to see a lot of plus or minus five, plus or minus six if you read the fine print. Um but you you generally are seeing national polls done with sample sizes around a thousand. Yeah. But then a subsample of the Republicans and Republican leaners for the primary poll and a similar size to the Democratic poll. So you're dealing with subsamples. Right. Uh, you're not you're not seeing pollsters try to do a thousand person Republican only poll because if you're doing that, then you're 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 not doing a Democratic poll at the same time. Right. Uh, and then there's the the rise of the Survey Monkey poll. Being right. reported on, you know, national uh, media outlets. Yeah, M- NBC has not not all the NBC polls are Survey Monkey polls. They have done partnerships with Survey Monkey for the immediate uh, post debate polling. Uh, I mean, and this is not meant to be um, like an online survey, like at your your local newspaper site, where it's completely unscientific. These are meant to be scientific online polls, but it's new methodology. And I feel the numbers for those polls have been a little bit different than the other polls that we've seen. Does this mean that maybe they're more right than the other polls? I have no idea. Um, but you're seeing um, there, there's certainly questions to raise whether, you know, how accurate a picture are, are you getting. And, of course, you never can really pr- fully test it because you could be accurate in October. Doesn't mean that that's going to be the result in February because all sorts of different things are going to happen if people yeah. make up their minds late. And, but the you know, problem yeah. being when when a lot of political commentary is premised on poll numbers, you have a situation where um, uh, that's actually – how do I put this? Um, so, OK. So in, in, in sports, let's say – if, if sports announcers or sports commentators are biased and they're rooting for the Redskins against the Cowboys, it doesn't really matter because on the field is what matters. And the, as long as the referees are unbiased, it doesn't really matter what is said during the broadcast. 
But in politics, um, it does matter what the the framing and the premise of questions, and this goes to the debate issue as well, with the RNC not liking the debate moderators. It really does matter what the commentary says, because the commentary actually can affect the players on the game, because the referees are we the people. And uh, so ultimately, um, isn't there a, a problem if, if so much of our commentary is based on polls that you could have a, a situation where bad polls become a self-fulfilling prophecy? If people think Trump is going to win, whether he really is or not, um, then that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because of the bandwagon effect. Well, I, I feel like that, that complaint, we, I feel I heard more in past years uh, that the media narrative is not giving insurgent candidates a chance. And you're kind of getting some of that now with uh, some of the hardcore Bernie Sanders fans. You know, well, we go, all the Insta polls had Bernie won the, the debate, but the media said Hillary won the debate, and now Hillary's doing better in the polls. Well, that's, that's not fair. Uh, and, uh, you know, a good candidate has to find a way to seize a media narrative. You don't just do your debate, go home and sleep for, for, for the next day and then see what happens. You know, Donald Trump in his first debate had a pretty bad debate, but then he like barreled into the TV studios and started attacking Megyn Kelly and stayed in the news and then managed to stay afloat in the polls. So, you know, good candidates do things like that. Uh, you can't, you, a, a candidate can't let, polling drive the narrative you have to do things to to shape the narrative and then continually to affect the polling i, I feel yeah. though in more recent uh months we're seeing uh the public not swayed by polls uh, almost going out of their way to say i'm not going to the polls decide what i say i, I don't care if uh, you, we you get a couple things in in um great britain well uh, with the one the scottish referendum on independence the 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 independent vote was leading in the polls, and that seemed to wake up the the constituency to stay unified with the UK, and then they're winning that race. And Ed Miliband was looking good uh, for prime minister in the polls, and the results went the total opposite way. Uh, but uh, the Canadian polls actually were pretty accurate. I mean, I mean Trudeau outperformed them. <laughs> he did even better than what the projections were saying, but the the polls were at least directionally correct in that they had him leading in the final final days. So it's not like I see polling failures uh, left and right, uh, but it, 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 it all, I mean, polling should always come with the disclaimer that th this, this should not be seen as predictive. This is, they're all snapshots. They're, they're even a snapshot, you know, one day, two days out because you don't know what those last minute shifts might, might be. Uh, but to the, and, and, and I think to your point, they, the public can react to them either way. They can be swept up in them and think the race is over, or they can cut against them and, and be determined to not prove them correct. And the, uh, I feel like there's sort of more of that as of late uh, in, in recent well, elections. Since we're talking, uh, since we got on this, this sort of media bias, uh, media narrative storyline, I mean, I do want to ask you, I don't want to relitigate the CNBC debate that, that's in the, the rearview mirror, but the story of Republicans trying to take control of the debates is a bit fresher. Um, there was an attempt, uh, maybe this is a microcosm of the problem on the right, I and mean, there was an attempt to sort of organize and band together, and that fell apart. Donald Trump helped uh, tear that apart when he decided unilaterally to, to do his own negotiating. Uh, but, um, but I guess the larger question remains, which is, uh, you know, first I think that, that, that technology now sort of means that it's po it is possible that that candidates could seize control from the networks and from the political parties. The institutions have less power than they used to. The media isn't respected. Uh, the political parties uh, aren't respected and aren't as powerful, uh, don't have the moral authority or statutory authority that they once did. And you've got technology like YouTube, Vine, other other ways that you can distribute content. Um is this crazy that Republicans uh, don't like having liberals moderate the debates, or is this a harbinger of things to come? Well, I, I, I do want to answer that, but I, I want to sort of walk us through how we got to the current point, because there was this complaint after the 2012 debates that 
they were too liberal. They made Republicans look bad. They asked them irrelevant questions about contraception and, uh, and, 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 and sort of a sense that this is a Republican primary process and it should be run by Republicans. And the RNC seized control of the debates and said, we will only have RNC-sponsored debates. And if you do a debate outside of the RNC-sponsored debates, you're, you'll be penalized for that. Uh, and conservatives seemed to cheer that the RNC was taking control of things. Um, you know, then they cut out MSNBC and they cut out um, uh, Univision, which some people in the party have a problem with in favor of Telemundo. Um, and but they kept it at CNBC. <laughs> uh, and and so after the last uh, debate, where these same complaints are being uh, aired again. It's, and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. Uh, the candidates seem to be mad at the RNC <laughs> for partnering with these people and uh, trying to do their own negotiation with with the is the next one Fox. Uh, the next one's Fox Business, I believe. Fox Business. Okay. Um, so so you have this attempt by the the candidates to to sideline the RNC and create a separate set of of uh, of debate rules with Fox business, which what I'm reading this morning is that that effort has fallen apart, that the candidates themselves can't agree on what these rules should be. And I imagine this sort of leaves it as, as a, as a status quo, but this, this, it, this seems to start getting a little comical <laughs> that, you know, you're, you're running out of people to be mad at <laughs> uh, for debates when perhaps you should just be saying, look, you're, you're running for president you get asked questions. Sometimes they're unfair. Sometimes they come from people that don't like you. But you answer them to prove you can answer tough questions. You, or you can answer unfair questions and, and yeah. turn them around to your benefit. I, okay, I, uh, I, agree, I agree with that uh, to a degree. And I think that you could argue, look, Rubio and Cruz handled hostile questions and managed to thrive in that debate. And if you want to be – if you're going to be in a general election with debates where the moderators are likely skewed liberal – then maybe getting some batting practice <laughs> will help you. And I think Rubio, by virtue of going through these these tests, these debates, is getting better, is getting much better, and it's sort of a crucible. On the other hand, um, you know, Barack Obama, uh, I think quite hypocritically, uh, was mocking Republicans, saying, you know, if, if, if they can't handle CNBC, how are they going to handle Putin? This is the same Democratic Party that refuses to have a Fox News debate, the same Democratic Party who's doing a forum with Rachel Maddow. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of hardball questions there. And it's the same Democratic Party that is having half the number of debates as Republicans. So I do think there is a point of diminishing returns uh, where we strangle the baby in the crib. Maybe six or seven debates against hostile moderators makes you stronger. Maybe eight or nine or ten <laughs> debates where you have uh, people asking, uh, have you stopped beating your wife yet, begins to actually hurt the Republican candidate's chances of winning a general election. Well, uh, I, I, I think you have a point in that, you know, Democrats in 2008 definitely had, there was an uprising against Fox saying, look, this is not a, this is not a news outlet. This is, a, this is a Republican Oregon. They don't want you to win at the end of the day. And you should not legitimize their network by appearing on them. Uh, you could make the case that, look, they should just do it anyway and prove they can, they can take the heat. Uh, uh, but they didn't. And, but they did do 26 debates in 2008. Um, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they weren't softball debates. They, they, there was plenty of, of mean questioning. Plenty of cheap shots taken in those debates by, by the moderators. It wasn't, it, it wasn't Rachel Maddow debates you know, from start to finish. Um, and you didn't see... You know, beyond the Fox debate, you didn't see additional complaining about the questioning beyond that. Well, I guess you got something from Hillary saying you're being too you're being too nice to Barack Obama, uh, but that's um, uh, uh, that, that that sort of happens in these uh, campaigns. But she still did the debates; uh, she didn't run away from them. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think what happened with CNBC was like this parade of left wing propaganda. <laughs> You know, you know, John Harward said to Mark Root, for example, this is one that keeps coming up. This came up in even uh, in our comment thread last week. You know, John Harward said there's a tax foundation analysis that says you your tax plan does more for the wealthy than the middle class. 
And then Rubio said, that's not true. I do great things for the bottom 10%. He was talking past John Harwood there because Harwood wasn't talking about the bottom 10. He was talking about the middle. Uh, they, talk, and they ended up talking past each other. Uh, John Harwood's allowed to ask that question. You know, that's, even if it's a question that's not fitting with Rubio's narrative, he's allowed to ask it. And Rubio can answer however he wishes. And the public can adjudicate the, the response. That's not... Uh, that's not a uh, subterfuge. That's 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 the normal process of debate of, of, of presidential questioning. No, yeah, I, uh, but I wouldn't. But I, I wouldn't. That wouldn't be my. Um, if I were looking to argue that the, the debate was biased or, uh, or or salacious, I would not use that as my uh, example. I mean, I agree with you. What was, that, what was that the question. worst example of the CNBC debate? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, go back to what Ted Cruz said when he just sort of rattled off the litany of the last five or six questions where they asked, was it Donald Trump about his comic book campaign and things like that? I mean, it was essentially the tone uh, throughout the whole debate uh, was look at this clown car. And it was additionally, uh, and then by the way, I, I think a part of the problem was that CNBC was just the tipping point. I mean, I think whether it was Fox or CNN, there's a growing frustration with an attempt to get ratings and almost an enjoyment out of getting these guys to fight with each other. And uh, it's like, well, uh, Rand Paul said this about you, Donald Trump. How do you respond to that? That kind of well, thing. But, that, but like, I mean, I agree completely that the kind of question, your poll ratings are terrible. Why are you still running? I, I, I hate that kind of question. You know, that doesn't, that, that, that's a horse. I hate all horse race questions. You know, you're there to learn about the candidate's position so I, the viewer, can think for myself who I want to support. I, I don't need to have this be an extension of a, of a cable right. TV pun and round table. Uh, but I don't think that was unique to CNBC. I, I feel all the debates do that all the time. Well, uh, they do, but I think that's part of, fundamentally part of the problem is that there, there are conflicts of interest. I mean, the Republican Party, their goal should be um, to, to have a debate that, uh, that informs Republican voters – um, and that makes it likely that the best Republican nominee will win and that prepares that nominee uh, to, win, to, to be in a general election. But the incentive of, of a TV moderators is to get ratings, um, to, uh, to, to stir up controversy, to generate you know, buzz. Uh, so they really have not only um, different – Motives, but in some cases, actually opposite motives or mutually exclusive goals. Well, I don't, but, but I don't think that going for ratings is at counter purposes of what the party wants. The party wants ratings. The party wants people to watch. The party wants this to be an entertaining uh, uh, um, event to attract uh, viewership and have people yeah. hear, the, hear their candidates. That's so, true, and that's it, the only no reason. No one wants I think... a dry, you know, twelve point plan policy wonkery festival uh, so that I mean, there's, a, there's a balance of course between doing that and doing something that's just for sensationalism but you need to have right. you need to have some glitz and to, and to have questions and say Rand Paul said this about you what do you say in response I mean that's 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 total legitimate debate the, a disagreement has been proffered in the in the campaigning let's have it out here and flesh out the differences so people can make a decision that that to me is not is not well, cheap rating stunt that's straight up debate. Well, again, I'm, t I'm torn on this. I, I am torn because I do think that there is a downside to having uh, candidates perpetually asked um, wedge questions um, and having them uh, trotted out there for entertainment purposes um, and, and, and being asked questions by people who, even if they're not overtly biased, do not share their worldview – I think there is a like a long term downside to that that clearly is hurting the party and clearly hurting the chances of the nominee. On the other hand, I've got three hands here. On the other hand, I think the, <laughs> on the other hand, I think like what really should happen is just limit it to five candidates, uh, have them seated and have a buzzer or a bell that that enforces time limits and maybe increase the time limits by 30 seconds or something. So I, I think like simple reforms like that. Um, could uh, really would go a long way towards solving the real problem. And then the last hand, my third hand that I'll throw out is I think there's a chance that this could go too far, right? So like while I resent the notion that, that Republicans 
ought to have um, liberal moderators essentially, uh, you know, interfering and, and, and messing up these debates. The other extreme would be horrible where where you basically have um, talk radio hosts um, doing it or where the candidates get to pre approve questions, you know, where, where the media essentially um, becomes, you know, a, a puppet and where the candidates have too much control and that the that doesn't so, that's not serving the public well either if they know what questions are coming and they get to decide the temperature of the room and what the graphics say about them um that so this is really a weird uh problem right now and again i think it it's it's coming about because of of technological and cultural changes that are that are really changing i mean in the old days the parties and the networks when I did it, even 20 years ago, it would have been unthinkable that the candidates could have, you know, seized control of something like this. Well, you know, Ted Cruz said the other day that if you haven't voted in a Republican primary, you should not be allowed to be a Republican primary debate moderator. Uh, I mean, and I, and I don't think everyone has that kind of a strict standard, but there's definitely a growing sense that within the conservative uh, diaspora, correct me if I'm wrong, that – it's it's sort of illegitimate to have a debate without some conservative uh, journalist or opinionator on the panel. That you need that for it to be a legitimate debate, which has never been the case uh, in our in our debate history. Uh, but it is. I mean, look, you in the old days, you know, this was all backroom stuff. That the, that the 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 choosing of a nominee wasn't left to the people at large, even in the. Right. In this, even in the sense of enriched Republicans, uh, but it was done by the party, uh, and it's only you know, relatively new, historically speaking, that this is somewhat yeah. of an open sourced process. But there were good sides and, to that bill, and as uh, sacrilegious as it sounds to say, the, um, these are double edged swords, and um, and 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 more democracy and more transparency have a downside. I mean, look, in, in the old days of the smoke filled rooms. Where the party bosses controlled things, th- those weren't necessarily good days. There were a lot of bad things about them, but they also kept crazy people <laughs> and dangerous people uh, from getting nominations and and and, and gaining uh, gaining power. I mean, I think they they did exert a certain service uh, by uh, those ba- and those back rooms. But what, it seems like what we're, what what the Republican Party is, some are trying to move towards is. More of a of a closed loop, where uh, this is decided within in the conservative family. So it's not quite party bosses. Uh, uh, certainly, it's an exertion of of, uh, of power by those in the conservative base, quote unquote. However, you wish to whether it's grass tops or grassroots or whatever. Uh, and if that is the ends up being the case. Um, and you you insulate that process from the broader media and 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 the broader public don't really get to look in uh, a, as much. Uh, are you going to produce a candidate that is that is battle tested for a general election? Yeah, look, uh, I agree with that. I agree with that. But I also think the other side of the coin, and this is, I mean, this is the kind of thing where I think it's a matter of degrees here. But the the other problem, obviously, is. Almost all the moderators are liberals. They're people who have a different worldview and, um, and, and in some cases a hostile worldview when it comes to asking questions. And Joe Scarborough, I was on Morning Joe the other day, um, and I didn't get to weigh in too much on this one, but, but Joe went on a, a rant. But I think, uh, I think he was right in many ways about how, you know, look at someone even like Tim Russert, uh, who was a Democratic political operative. He worked for Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Uh, Chris Matthews um, worked for Tip O'Neill and Jimmy Carter. Um, George Stephanopoulos, the host of This Week, who does moderate, I think moderated a Republican debate last time around, um, worked for Bill Clinton not that long ago. And so Republicans and conservatives just don't get those gigs. I mean, George Will gets to go on this week before he went to Fox, but he was always identified as conservative columnist George Will. They don't get to be the host who uh, is, gets this sort of, you know, nonpartisan, above the fray uh, thing bestowed upon them. And so most of these moderators are liberals 
who are somehow getting to decide what questions, and the selection bias is the worst probably, are asked but of the, Republicans. But the two, the, the two main moderators, uh, we, we, had a, we had a Fox debate where you can't call anybody a liberal there. We had a CNN debate where Jake Tapper was the lead. You know, he doesn't have uh, a background in Democratic Party politics. Well, uh, some of these, I think, his, I think Jake Tapper's wife like works or worked for NARAL. And I mean, let's look at Chuck Todd. I think is his wife works or worked for Jim Webb. I mean, even the guys who are that we like and respect and tend to do, you know, pretty good jobs. If they if they're not former. And by the way, Jake Tapper, didn't he write for uh, didn't he wasn't he originally a writer for like he was for Salon. Was Salon. I mean, is there a yeah. more liberal outlet than Salon? I mean, Jake well, Tapper's, I, I a, good, Jake you, Tapper's you, a good Jake, journalist. Jake Tapper does not. Jake does not function in any way, shape, or form as as a House liberal at CNN. I'm not saying. I, I'm not saying he does. What I'm saying is your best example that you just cited, who I think is a good journalist, is somebody who worked at Salon, and who's. I, I think I'm pretty sure it's saying his wife works or worked for Nayral. Well, uh, I, I'm go not, check I that mean, before you quote me. On I mean, it, but there, there's a difference between uh, having some uh, liberal sympathies uh, in your background and functioning as a professional journalist. I mean, well, it, look, it, I think, I, I, mean, look it, I think I'm a fair and and uh, thoughtful journalist, and you know, my wife is a uh, Republican fundraiser, a political consultant. So, I mean, I, I'm going to be the last guy. To say that these guys are, are disqualified. I'm just saying that, like, it seems that disproportionately <laughs> the people moderating uh, or, or, you know, these debates are people who um, have a liberal worldview that is part of who they are. I mean, I'm not saying but, that they try to bias debates. Mm-hmm. And some of them might even they, some of them might even overcompensate on occasion to get past their background. But even if uh, even if you don't like that fact, I mean, he, he, the CNN debate also included Hugh Hewitt, and the and the CNBC debate included Rick Santelli. I mean, it's not like there wasn't representation. That, that that's more representation than you normally get from you know movement conservatives than than is normal at a debate. But that's uh, a process. And, but that was a process of as the Hugh Hewitt thing is a process of the RNC trying to prevent this from happening. And Hugh's great. He wrote the forward to my book, and I hope he has more. Um, involvement in, in upcoming debates. Um, but in that one debate, what did he get? Maybe five minutes out of like a three hour debate? Maybe? I mean, well, I, I think that's where we are right now, where you, 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 you give an inch and you want a mile. So the conservatives <laughs> are, saying, are saying we want to have the, yeah. the conservative journalists be the dominant function, the dominant role in these debates and not have. Uh, the, the so-called liberal media run the show. So that's, that's where we are. That's where they're, All right, they're you got me. I was, I was low energy before we started this. But since we started, <laughs> I've drank a lot of coffee and, uh, and I've gotten riled up about liberal media bias. So. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go in for the, for the kill now then. All right. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a week since the, the last Republican debate where obviously the media – was very praiseworthy of, of Marco Rubio. This is the go, go to our earlier discussion about, you know, media reaction versus public reaction. Um, we are not seeing um, widespread evidence of a Rubio surge in the polls. I do think there is one New Hampshire poll where he had he had moved up considerably, I think, in, 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 not in first place, but a solid, I think a solid third. Um, but the national polling I've seen, he hasn't really budged. Um, Carson is leading most of these polls now. Uh, Ted Cruz made a big jump in one of the polls that I saw post debate. That was one of the sur- I think it was a Survey Monkey NBC poll. Um, does that? I mean, I, I've been one to say that you know the real. I guess it says to you that the real show here is really Jeb versus Rubio because the these outsider candidates Carson and Trump are going to collapse by 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 January. Um, but does it matter for Rubio's sake? That he's not, you know, tearing it up in the polls right out of the gate of this debate. Does that, it, to the extent that the game is consolidating establishment support? I know there are some anecdotal examples of donors moving to him in the past week, but does that process get blunted because the poll spike isn't evident out of this first debate? Um. I would say a couple things. One, we just got to talking about the problems with the polls. <laughs> so let's begin with that as a caveat. Um, 
two, I have seen polls that show Rubio uh, having benefited from the debate. Um, three, I think there actually is a concern that he may be peaking too soon. I mean, like, I think Rubio wants to be in third or fourth place. I think it's like, and this will sound like happy talk or like I'm just sort of like a Rubio booster. But in all honesty, um, I think Rubio would, the worst thing would be if Rubio were somehow got a bump and he was like in first place. I think he wants to sort of bide his time and you want to, you know, you want to sort of like win out and, and, and have that momentum going into the playoffs. You know, you want this to, you want to peak in, in January, um, not peak in January, but you want to hit your stride in January. We're still three months out, you know, from any voting. Right. So um, I, 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 I'm curious. I, I don't know the answer to this. I haven't been following Rubio that closely up until this point. How, how hard is he campaigning? I mean, is he really, I mean, I, I, here we can also have misvotes and whatnot, but I, I'm not sure. I don't get what he's doing instead. Is he in Iowa, New Hampshire a lot? Is he doing a lot of town halls? Um, or, or is he, you know, keeping a steady pace because I think it's, he doesn't want to peak uh, that late, peak, peak too early? I'm not the expert on this because I don't follow these guys around, but my, my sense is he's keeping a steady pace. I, I think that, the, and I think you can say almost the same thing about Ted Cruz. I think that that they have made a, a calculated decision um, to um, to keep. I think a steady pace is a really good way of, of putting it. I, I think that they have um, that that they have intentionally been running this kind of campaign. Um, so maybe it'll be a huge mistake. But if you look at Scott Walker and somebody who said go big or go home and he went home i think rubio and cruz too are sort of uh maybe smart the kind of stealth uh campaigns they're they're building <clears throat> sort of solid campaigns uh without um you know without uh peaking too early so well I mean, you know when uh, when john i mean I, I talked about the john Kerry parallels uh in one of our earlier shows you know that when Kerry won iowa seemingly out of nowhere I think one of his backers said, you know, the, you know, the mantra is uh, organize, organize, organize and get hot at the end. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I don't I don't know, you know, how good is Ruby organizing? I think it's hard to know from the outside. You know, p- people trash talk about their ground game, but you really don't know who really has it till till the <laughs> game is played. Uh, but, uh, you know, Je- you know the, people say, well, Jeb's running into the Scott Walker mistake because he's always cutting staff and cutting salaries and whatnot. Um, but is it possible that he has invested in some ground game already that can pay off later and that other candidates, particularly Rubio, uh, if they haven't put that money and didn't have the money to put in to those operations earlier, they, they can't be, they, they can't be built at the last minute. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I have heard about Cruz doing interesting things like really focusing on the South, the deep South. Um, and on like Puerto Rico and, and places like that, <clears throat> um, sort of employing an, uh, an interesting, almost Obama-like uh, campaign to win primaries and, and states that others might overlook and to score delegates. In the case of Rubio, I, um, I don't know about the, the ground game or the infrastructure per se, but I really – I do get the impression that they are intentionally um, taking it sort of – calm and in stride and just sort of the um the added you know i've talked to his people off the record and i mean without betraying anything i mean the sense i get is like it's you just show up every day and do your job and you don't worry about what other people are doing you just show up every day and do what you what your plan calls for you to do and then good things will happen that that's the mentality that's the philosophy they're just playing their own game. They're not worried about raising the most money. Uh, they're not worried about, um, you know, winning a given media, saying something crazy so that they win today's media cycle. Um, that they're focused sort of long term, building slow and steady, and just show up every day and do the work. That's the impression that I get. And they've been saying this for months now, before he, you know, long before this last debate, before he peaked. And uh, long enough now that it, that it, I'm convinced that it's sort of manifesting the uh, the seeds that they're that they've planted. You know, the the vision. There's a method to the madness, and and I think the vision is is sort of uh, coming true. 
uh, I'm inclined to leave it there because I, I got to yeah. jump to a. We can leave it there. But is, but is there anything else you want to add before we go? Uh, a lot we could talk about, Bill. But I think we've uh, I think we've given given the public uh, more than enough at this point. <laughs> so. We don't want them to get too uh, too greedy, you know. They they, no. they, 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 they they take what we give them, and they yeah. like it. The scraps. <laughs> uh, no, that's it. Check out, uh, you know, check us out. Uh, what, what do you? Anything you want to plug, Bill? What are you writing? What are you working on? Uh, I think I got I got nothing to plug. Um, no. I, I got I got I'm empty. Uh, All right. But uh, but I, I, I but praise to uh, my Northampton uh, election winners. The Northampton, Massachusetts had their election yesterday. Uh, my wife, Gina Louise, uh, winning another term on the city council. Uh, good friend, Bill Dwight, winning his re-election to the city council. And uh, Katie White, uh, a new political career beginning uh, with uh, uh, winning a, board, a seat on the on the library trustee board. You know, so that that's this is where greatness begins. Uh, it's been it's an exciting day here in Western Mass. Excellent. Well, congrats on that. Uh, Pre-order my book, Too Dumb to Fail. Check out my podcast, too, Matt Lewis and the News on iTunes. That's a a, a star, uh, star star-studded podcast there. It is. It is. It's a lot of fun to do. And uh, we'll see you guys back here in the DMZ next week. Thanks, Bill. Take care.